an altar of acacia wood, three cubits high. It is to be square, five cubits long and five cubits wide. Make a horn at each of the four corners, so that the horns and the altar are of one piece. Make a bronze basin, with it a bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water in it. Make a table of acacia wood two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Make an altar of acacia wood for burning incense. It is to be square, a cubit long and a cubit wide, and two cubits high. Shalom, shalom, and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry. I'm Yosef Ben Avram, and you've joined me today for part five of the Schoolmaster, which in truth is actually a continuation of part four. Part four, we began to discuss the furnishings of the Mishkan, the furnishings of the tabernacle in relation to the work of Messiah Yeshua. So part five is a continuation as we begin and we continue to look at more of the furnishings found within the tabernacle. So brothers and sisters, before we start, let's pray. Father Yahweh, we want to thank you and praise you and worship you. Father, we want to thank you that you are the great I Am. Father, that you are the one and true Elohim. And I want to pray in the name of Yeshua Mashiach that as we get into your word today, Father, that you will really come by your spirit, minister to our hearts, show us, Father, the way, the truth, and the life. Show us the importance of this earthly shadow in relation to the heavenly. I pray, Yahweh, that we will not be people, Father, that are tossed around by every wind of doctrine, but that we will be striving to be holy as you are holy, that we will be striving, Abba Father, to walk in the narrow way that leads to life. And your word says so clearly that narrow is the path that leads to life and that few find it. I pray in the name of Yeshua that those that are listening to this teaching today, Father, that they will be of those that desire to enter in through the narrow way. And we thank you for their lives. We thank you for their families. And I pray a special blessing over this time together in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, so far in this series, we've come to see the importance of the earthly shadow in relation to our walk of holiness and perfection. Now, the word perfection in the Hebrew is tamim. And we have spoken about that word often throughout all the teachings, starting right back when I cannot even remember. But as far back as the covenants and even before that, we've been speaking about the importance of being tamim. Now, the meaning of the word tamim, it means without blemish. We know that the word of Yahweh says that he will return, Yeshua will return for his bride, who will be without spot and blemish. So this is a very, very important word to come to understand. And the entire tabernacle structure, as well as the covenants, all 
um, are interlinked with one another. They all overlay each other. And if you understand the covenants and you understand the tabernacle structure and the work of Messiah Yeshua within that tabernacle, I believe, brothers and sisters, that you will be on a great, great journey, a journey of holiness, a, a journey of righteousness, and a journey of being drawn closer to the Father through the work of Messiah Yeshua. Now, we learned in part one about the importance of the schoolmaster as a guardian to bring you and I to spiritual maturity in Messiah. And we heard or, or we came to understand that Rabbi Shiyu continually speaks about the importance of spiritual maturity. He speaks about how so many people that he himself would teach, was teaching were being tossed around by every wind of doctrine. They were, they were carnal in their thinking and in their mindset. They were not... Um, feasting on the meat of Yahweh's word. Instead, they were drinking milk. And he said, how I wish that you were mature, how I wish that you would grow up, yet I have to come and teach you these elementary things again, these things that you should have been knowing f since the last time that I taught you. You should have grown up in your faith. Now, we've seen that the purpose of our lives, brothers and sisters, before we can be the next evangelist or teacher or, or, or pastor or whatever you desire to be in the kingdom of, of, of Messiah Yeshua, before you can be those things, we need to learn to be holy as Yahweh is holy. This is so, so important. You see, our lives are supposed to be lived as a living sacrifice, a sacrifice that is dying daily. Yet we are to be maturing in our walk so that we can press through that outer court. And we have defined the outer court as the place where the altar was, the place where the brazen labor was. And we spoke about that in the previous part. And we said that it wasn't bronze, it was copper. And that's very, very important to understand. And we said that that outer court is significant of the Abrahamic covenant. In other words, salvation. Everyone who believes in the promise of Messiah Yeshua as the Savior, the, the gift of eternal life or the gift of salvation, let me put it that way, the gift of salvation, the free gift of salvation, everyone who puts their faith in Messiah Yeshua, those people are part of that covenant. They have received salvation. But salvation only equals salvation. We are not to remain just at salvation. We are to go from being a child into becoming a son and daughter of inheritance. We are to become Tamim. That's exactly what Yahweh wants. And that is why everything in the tabernacle, everything that Rabbi Sheol speaks about, is speaking about the importance of maturity. So brothers and sisters, like I said, we are to walk so that we can pass through the outer court right into the Holy of Holies, which is significant of the Davidic covenant which we are going to be looking at as we go through in this teaching. The Davidic covenant, brothers and sisters, is speaking about the realm of sons and daughters. It is the perfect will of Elohim. It is the place of a royal priesthood. It is the place where we receive the key, not to the kingdom, but of the kingdom, where we receive the right to be sons and daughters, kings and priests in the order of Melchizedek, so that we can go and proclaim the word on behalf of our great magistrate. But if you are not there yet, if you are not living the life, if you are not walking in the commandments of Yahweh, if you are not walking in His eternal truth, then unfortunately, you are still going to be a child. And you are not ready yet to have the keys of the kingdom. Yet as stated, you and I are never to stop doing the good or the pleasing will of Elohim. In other words, when we got saved, we learned all about what that meant. And we are to continue to apply the principles that we learned when we got saved to our lives. As we continue through the covenants of Yahweh and we begin to study Yahweh's word, His Torah, and, and we enter into that second covenant, we do not forget what we learned in the first covenant. We are to continue learning Every single principle that is found in the covenants needs to apply to our lives so that we can graduate and that we can move on in the process that the Father has laid before us. And that is why continually I state this, that covenants are progressive. 
and they work in time frames. We have entered into the realm and the time frame of Yahweh's royal priesthood, his, his priesthood rising up, the true sons and daughters. That is why it says in the word that all creation is waiting with eager anticipation for the sons and daughters of Yahweh. Why? Because they are the ones, brothers and sisters, that Yahweh is going to use as his righteous judges upon this earth to restore that which is broken. Yet today we have people throwing out the Torah. We have people throwing out the importance of holiness. We have people throwing out, as we're going to look at the end of this teaching, the importance of what the Father has given through His Son to His body in order for the body to come to the full measure of maturity. And we're going to talk about that as we go on in this teaching. Now, like I said, brothers and sisters, we are never to stop doing the good or the pleasing will of Elohim. Each one of these is significant of a type of covenant. The good will is significant of the Abrahamic covenant. The pleasing will is significant of the Mosaic covenant and doing the Torah. But we don't stop there. We are to continue so that we can do the perfect will of Elohim. So that we might become the true representation of Messiah Yeshua upon this earth. You see, this is a true picture of our walk with Messiah. As he came to serve, so we need to learn the importance of serving one another and growing up in our walk. That is what it's all about. You see, Abraham learned what it meant to be a servant before he became a friend. And the Bible says very clearly that Abraham was a friend of Yahweh. But before he became a friend, he learned how to serve. So many people today in the Messianic faith have got so focused on the Mosaic Covenant, everything found in Torah, and forgot that they need to be servants first. We need to learn to serve one another in spirit and in truth, laying our lives down for our brethren. Now I've mentioned over and over the difference between Lot and Noah. And you know, the Bible equates Lot to a righteous man. Yet when it speaks about Noah, it says that Noah was righteous and perfect. Noah was Tamim. And this is why the tabernacle the covenants and the understanding of holiness is of a vital, vital importance to you and I in this generation. You see, the difference between Lot and Noah was the following. Lot was righteous. He was righteous in the fact that he believed, yet his faith did nothing more in his life. It never activated a life of maturity. It never activated a life where he walked a Tamim lifestyle. Instead, he was made righteous in what? In the promise. Just like so many people today in the church and in other places where they have been made righteous by the blood of Messiah Yeshua. Why? Because they believed in the sacrifice and in the death and resurrection of Messiah Yeshua. They accepted Him as their Savior, but they only accepted Him. They never chose to walk a pure lifestyle. So they went to church, but the rest of the week they lived exactly like the world. And this doesn't only apply to those in the church, it applies to everybody. That is why I said continually, come out of her, my people. Come out of those places that defile you. Because if you don't, you're going to land up being a lot. And you'll never truly be a Noah or Abraham. And you'll walk around with this idea, oh, because I'm saved, I'm a priest. No, to be a priest means, brothers and sisters, a priest was born a priest. Yet he had to learn and grow up. And only when he was the right age was he ready to take over the reins. This is what the father is saying. It doesn't just mean because you're born into the family that you're automatically a son. Because you're born in the family, you become a child of the family. You become a child of Yahweh. But He desires for you to become a son and a daughter of righteousness. You see, brothers and sisters, Lot. Lot was saved but he was not spiritually mature. He wasn't tamim. He wasn't blameless or without blemish. He was just saved by the skin of his chinny chin chin. He was an outer court believer. And those outer court believers, brothers and sisters, in the book of Revelation, it says that the anti-Messiah is given 42 months. And it says, leave out Revelation 11. It says, leave out the outer court. And those that are there. For it shall be trampled underfoot for 42 months. And in Daniel it says that in that time there will be many that will shine like the stars and they will teach others about my righteousness. 
Yet others will have to remain a little while longer so as to be what? Purified. Brothers and sisters, if you think for one second that you're going to get to enter into the Holy of Holies because you keep on just mulling around in the outer court and all you're doing with your life is just saying, oh, but I'm saved, but you've never done anything with it. You're in for a serious surprise. That's not how it works in Yahweh's kingdom. It's not a, a works-based faith. No, but it's an obedience faith that produces works. Why? Because of your love for Messiah Yeshua. Because you desire to be without blemish. Go and read Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. I've said this many times. Go and read Revelation 22 verse 14 in two different Bibles. Read it in the scriptures and read it in your NIV or your New LT or whatever other translation you choose. And you'll come to find the following. The Scriptures Bible says, Blessed is he who does and keeps the commandments of Yahweh, so that he or she might have the right to the tree of life. So, in order to obtain eternal life, you need to be doing the commandments of Yahweh. But in other translations it says, Blessed is he who has his robes clean or his robes washed. They shall have the right to the tree of life. Brothers and sisters, then, what is it actually telling you? In order to be without blemish, in order to have robes that are made white or white robes, you have to be doing Yahweh's commandments. When you do His word, it is like a washing of water upon your soul. Today there are so many people, and I've said it over and over and over, teaching about the priesthood of Messiah Yeshua, but they lack holiness in their lives. And they don't teach it to others. They teach all the understanding, but they don't teach the importance of teshuva. We are supposed to be alive in a generation of teshuva. That is why it says in Acts chapter 3 verse 19, it says, Repent, so that the times of refreshing might come from the Master, so that He might send you Messiah Yeshua, who has been pre-appointed for you. Why do you think Messiah Yeshua hasn't come yet? Because it hasn't been true to Shuva. Because those in leadership are not teaching it or speaking about it. Brethren, this is why I've stated over and over the importance of understanding the four main covenants, as well as the cost of being a true disciple. I have spoken about what it costs you to be a true disciple. You see, brothers and sisters, you need to understand, when you get saved, you're a believer. But as you mature in your faith, you become a true disciple. Messiah Yeshua went and called 12 disciples. They were believers. They had to walk with Him in order to become a true disciple. The message of the hour is like a diamond. I wish I could understand or explain this to you so that you could understand. You see, it's a many-sided message, a message that holds much truth. And once a person begins to understand, that's when the pieces of the puzzle fit together. And you'll begin to see the scriptures in a whole new way. You'll see it from the book of Genesis all the way through to Revelation as one thing. I need to be mature. I need to be clean. I need to be made right. You need to be on fire. You see, Rabbi Shul understood the importance of the shadow more than most will give him credit for. Furthermore, he also understood that a person who was just saved was never able to fully be a priest. Why? Because being a priest has everything to do with maturity. How can a child hold the fire of Yahweh in his hands? The same applies for how can the profane take hold of of that which is holy. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to say it again. We need to move from being a child into becoming a son or daughter. And this is the same as going from being a believer into being a true disciple. Now as we continue to move through the Mishkan, the tabernacle, we will come to see how each section is speaking about the different covenants. Each covenant comes with obligations and terms. You see, you need to apply what each covenant means in your life. It is you who chooses where you want to be in this walk. How? We choose by the commitments that we make according to Yahweh's word. And you choose how much of a commitment you want to make to each and every covenant. 
That is why so many people fall out at salvation. Because they are not willing to make a commitment to the, to the, the truth that is found in Yahweh's Torah. And then you have others that are stuck in the Torah and they're not ready to become the sons and daughters that the Father wants them to be. They're not willing to lay down their lives and their religion. They're so focused on doing things. Instead of allowing what they have done to reflect out of their lives. The bottom line is that you cannot expect to handle the holy things of Yahweh if you are still a defiled, immature, and confused child. Confusion is not of the Father. So many people today are tossed around by every wind of doctrine. Why? We're going to see it at the end of this teaching. They are tossed around and confused. This is why when we line everything up with the covenants, we begin to see that many are simply not qualified. Either they have no regard for the Torah, or they simply feel that parts of the Torah no longer applies to them at all. Now I've said this before, and, and, and the truth of the matter is that the teaching of the book of the covenant versus book of the law, it is a half-sided message that teaches biblical interpretation minus the truth of holiness and maturity to its hearer. Biblical interpretation according to them. Not according to the found principles within the scriptures that teaches you better be holy. Instead it's teaching people how to interpret the scriptures according to a doctrine, book of the covenant, book of the law. Furthermore, you know, the church, brothers and sisters, the church is also, the church has robbed so many people and they have not taught the aspect and the importance of holiness by removing the need to keep the instructions of Yahweh. They have removed the need to keep the instructions of Yahweh, Yahweh and thereby they have not taught the importance of holiness, righteousness and godliness. They've taught Christ-likeness to a degree, but they haven't taught the importance of keeping Yahweh's Torah. You see, it's the Torah that is signified by the second section of the tabernacle. As we spoke before in the previous teachings, I said to you that after the, 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 the copper laver came another curtain, and at that curtain there was five pillars at that entrance. The entrance that led you in to the actual tabernacle, if I have to put it that way, the holy place. There were five pillars and you know, this speaks to me about the fact that you and I, once we have been, been, been mikvered, once we have accepted the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua, and we come to the place of decision where we accept His Ruach in our lives, it is now time to begin to study and understand His instructions. It's once we take the Torah and we begin to learn what is found in the Torah that we enter into a more mature relationship with Him. But unfortunately, many today in the Messianic movement have set up camp at just the study of the Torah and they think that that's the end of the line. It's not the end of the line. There's so much more to learn and understand. And in order for you to become a priest, you need to become Tamim. But you also need to be one of those that has the keys of the kingdom. He's not going to give you the authority of his kingdom to go out there and do works for him. If you're still stuck in the old. You see, in the outer court is the elementary things of washings and laying on of hands. The things that we should have been applying to our lives. After we got saved. Yet there are so many people today that are still stuck at the elementary things of Yahweh's word. Let's have a look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. Therefore, having left the word of the beginning of the Messiah, let us go on to what? To perfection. That is the Greek word teleos. And we're going to look at that word as we go on this evening. But it is, it is, it is the Greek word of the Hebrew word tamim. It means to be mature in character and in integrity. It says, let us go on to spiritual maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, as so many people are doing today. They've been saved for 10, 15 years, but they haven't found their freedom yet. 
So they're going back and they're laying a foundation of repentance from dead works. And their faith gets shaken by the trials of this world. So they have to go back and lay a foundation of belief again towards Elohim. Then he says in verse 2, in the teaching of immersions, mikvahs, the teaching of being mikvahed, and the laying on of hands. He never says that laying on of hands is bad. He says, and the laying on of hands. In other words, the praying for the ruach to be in your life. Why are you still going back to that? And of the resurrection of the dead and of everlasting judgment. You know, brothers and sisters, as we stand at the place of decision, the entrance to the holy place, it is there that we are faced with a choice to lay things down. It should have been after you got saved that you were standing at that place and said to the Father, I am ready. I want to walk this road, not because of what I can get, but because of what I can give. You see, if we want to be the light of the world as signified by that menorah that is found in that holy place. Then we need to first learn, brothers and sisters, to walk in the light of the truth, which is the word of Yahweh. For it says in the scriptures, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You see, we need to take that word and we need to put it in our inward parts. We need to digest it. We need to feast upon it. We need to live that word out in a generation where there is no light. We need to become people, brothers and sisters, that when people ask us about our king, that we speak the very words of Torah, that we speak from Genesis to Revelation, everything that is found in His Word will come flowing out from our inward parts. Why? Because we are found in Him. You see, it's in the outer court that salvation happens and the immersion. Now it's time to move on. He wants you to move on. He's standing behind you with His hand on your back and He's saying, let's go. I want you to become priest in the order of righteousness i want you to walk in the pleasing will that i've said before you remember that as we continue through this journey we learn the instructions of our master never forgetting all that we learned in the good will never ever forgetting what we learned when we got saved how to serve one another, how to be a person of light, how to rejoice and be glad in our King. So many people today are even listening to this teaching right now and you've lost your joy. David says, renew in me the joy of my salvation. Some of you need to go and pray that prayer and ask the Father to restore in your life the joy of your salvation. So that you'll be on fire again for Him. Now, brothers and sisters, we've come to the next part of this teaching and we've come to the part where we're going to be speaking about the table of showbread, the table of face, the table of the presence of Yahweh. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 23 onwards to verse 30, it says the following. It says, And you shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide and a cubit and a half high. And you shall overlay it with clean gold or pure gold and shall make a molding of gold all around. And shall make for it a rim of a hand breadth all around. And shall make a gold molding for the rim all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold. And put the rings on the four corners that are in its four legs. The rings are close to the rim as holders for the poles to lift the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And the table shall be lifted with them. Remember, as we said in the previous teaching, all these furnishings were to be transported whenever they would move throughout the wilderness. They would take these things with them and carry them upon their shoulders. And then it goes on in verse 29 and it says, And you shall make its dishes and its ladles and its jars and its bowls for pouring. Make them of clean gold. And you shall put the showbread. The showbread on the table before me continually. This will be before me continually. It's so important, everything that we find in these passages of Scripture. Now let's look at the makeup of this table. It's a very strange word. And no, I'm not swearing, but it's a very, very strange word. But it says the following. Shittim wood. Every vessel in this tabernacle, brothers and sisters, every single piece of furniture speaks of 
Messiah Yeshua. You know, the word speaks of his sinless life. And you know, one researcher has noted that this wood is resistant to decay because the tree deposits in the heartwood many waste substances, which are preservatives and render the wood unpalatable to insects, making the wood dense and difficult to be penetrated by water and other decay agents. Isn't that just amazing that Yahweh chose this specific wood to build his vessels of glory out of? Furthermore, the acacia tree, they thorny trees. And they're also used for medicinal purposes, which I found very, very interesting. Now, when thinking of Yeshua, we need to understand that he was sinless and there was no sin found in him. You see, this wood speaks of his incorruptible flesh. And we're going to speak about that as we get to the veil. His incorruptible flesh. It was his flesh that was without sin. It was because of his flesh that he laid down upon that stake that you and I have access to the throne of Messiah, Yeshua. We have access to the Father now through his flesh. That is why we need to take off this body of death. That is why on a daily basis we need to be dying to self and putting on the body of Messiah Yeshua. We need to clothe ourselves in righteousness. That is why the teaching on the armor of Yahweh is so, so important. You see, the Bible tells us in John chapter 51 verse 60 that Yeshua would not see decay because his flesh was not of this world. You see, so too, this wood was incorruptible. It, and, and the word wood, as translated in the Septuagint, is very, very important to understand. Because the word wood, it actually speaks of the root of Jesse who comes out of dry ground, who bears fruit. And it's significant of the picture of resurrection. Furthermore, the word shittim comes from a word that means to pierce through. And we know that Yeshua was pierced through. And in his piercing, he defeated the fleshly nature of sin. He took on our sins upon the stake. And he was pierced. He was bruised. He was crushed. But he wasn't defeated. We know as well that in his resurrection, that when he rose from the grave, that he defeated Hasatan. He overcame him, brothers and sisters. And the word of Yahweh says that he who descended also ascended on high. He gave gifts unto men. Furthermore, the tree of thorns. This tree was a thorny bush. It was like a thorny tree. And we know, brothers and sisters, that Yeshua wore a crown of thorns. He wore a crown of thorns upon his head. And in Psalm 96 verse 10, our Messiah, or Masoretic influence text says the following. It says that Yahweh reigns. But in the untampered Hebrew, this verse says, Yahweh reigns from the wood or from the tree. He reigns from the place where he died. He reigns from that place. And he has been risen. He has raised from the dead. Now, the, why, why is it important to understand that in the outer court, we have copper. And copper, brothers and sisters, as I said, speaks about judgment. Whereas as we move into the holy place and the holy of holies, we begin to see that every single one of the furnishings is overlaid with gold. We saw that the menorah was made from one piece of gold, a hammered work, the Bible says. And we also know that as we get into the Ark of the Testament, that the two angels, the two cherubim that were facing one another, were also made out of hammered gold, a solid work. Every single thing in this tabernacle, brothers and sisters, has a specific meaning. You see, gold speaks of deity. It also speaks of purification. It speaks about the fact that gold is that metal, brothers and sisters, that goes through the fire of, of, of a great heat, if I have to put it that way. I almost said the fire of trial, but we go through the fire of trial. So that the dross, just as the gold has to go through a process of purification, so that the dross will come to the top. And in the end, what happens? The goldsmith looks into that liquid and he sees his own reflection. This is what the Father wants from us. This is what Yeshua is doing. He is that fire. His Ruach in us is the fire. And the Bible says in the book of Malachi that He is the refiner's fire. He's the one that is sitting like a refiner's fire. Testing our hearts. Seeing what's inside. 
How much have you given to him? How much are you willing to lay down? Furthermore, the table is two components, yet one table. And this is very important because it speaks of the deity and humanity of Yeshua. He was 100% Yahweh, and yet he was clothed in 100% humanity, but not of humanity's origin. This is so, so, so amazing. In Exodus chapter 24 to 25, it tells us that the table had a double crown. And the double crown on the table, it points to Yeshua HaMashiach, who is our king priest. He is our Melech Sadek. He is our king as well as our priest. He was born as king who would later be immersed and come forth as our Melech Sadek. He was crowned king priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now furthermore, there were four vessels of pure gold on the table with the bread. There were dishes, bread plates, and they were used for carrying the bread into the holy place. There were pans or spoons, and this was used to sprinkle frankincense upon the bread. It was poured on top of the bread and burned on the altar of incense. In Leviticus chapter 24 verse 7 it says the following, And you shall put clear frankincense on each row, and it shall be on the bread as a remembrance portion an offering made by fire to Yahweh. On every Sabbath, he is to range it before Yahweh continually from the children of Israel, an everlasting covenant. Furthermore, there were pitchers, kind of like small jugs for liquid offerings and for meal and drink offerings. And then there were bowls. These were vessels containing the frankincense where the frankincense was poured into. Now, the Bible tells us that there were 12 loaves of bread, six stacked on one end of the table and six on the other end. And there was a complete number, a complete number of 12. And this is very, very important because the 12 loaves represent the 12 tribes. And we need to understand that this was a meal offering. And as such, these, these loaves or these bread had to be unleavened bread. This is very important to understand. And this puts things into better perspective because Yeshua is the bread of life for all mankind. But we know that his life was sinless and it was offered up for the sake of those that are lost in sin. Hence the reason for this bread to be of unleavened bread. It's speaking about the fact that he was without sin. We know that the Bible says that, that we are to get rid of the leaven because it's significant of sin. Now, furthermore, the very nature of bread is to provide physical sustenance. I am not one who enjoys bread. I don't eat a lot of it at all. But I, I know that, that it, is a, it, is, it is, especially here in, in South Africa, it is one of the staple foods for many, many households. And its whole purpose is to provide physical sustenance. As you eat the bread and you digest it, what does it do? It becomes part of you. And you know, the very nature of the word of Yahweh is to provide spiritual sustenance. And as it is received within us, it becomes part of your very nature. That is why we are to feast on Messiah Yeshua. That is why his disciples, when he said, drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, so many of them said, this is a hard thing to understand. And they abandoned him. We are to become part of him. We are to feast on him. Now, just as the table always speaks of fellowship and communion, so the table of showbread points to Yeshua. It's so, so important that we understand this. Now, in John chapter 6, verse 48, it says the following. In John chapter 6, verse 48 to 63, it says this, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and died. This is the bread coming down of heaven that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And indeed, the bread which I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews argued with one another, saying, How can this one give his flesh to eat? Then Yeshua said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one partaking of my flesh and drinking of my blood has everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day, for my body is truly food and my blood is truly drink. He who eats my body and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. We cannot abide in him apart from eating and drinking. I hope you're beginning to see that. We need to feast on Messiah Yeshua. Even as the living Father sent me and I live through the Father, also the one partaking me 
even that one will live through me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and died, the one partaking of this bread will live forever. He said these things, teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum. Then many of his, of his disciples, having heard, they said, This word is hard. Who is able to hear it? But knowing in himself that his disciples were murmuring about this, Yeshua said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascending to the place where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh does not profit nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. We need the words of Yeshua because they give life to us. We are to feast upon his word. In John chapter 6, 32 to 35, it says the following, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of Yahweh is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. We already read this previously in, in what I just read, but I'm rereading it to you so that you can get a deeper understanding. It says, he who comes to me will never go hungry. Are you hungry? Are you hungry for, for Yeshua today? Are you hungry for an understanding and a depth in your walk with Messiah Yeshua? Are you thirsty? Everyone who believes in me will never be thirsty. Now what's interesting is that the bread, this bread that was to be placed upon the table, the table of showbread, was always prepared before Shabbat. And the old bread would be eaten that very Shabbat. So the bread that stood for six days would be consumed by the priesthood. One bread made up of 12 loaves in 12 rows. 12 tribes which were divided, as we know the word says, into two houses. The house of Ephraim and the house of Judah. And they are still divided today. You see, we must become the empowered body of Messiah through the very Ruach that is supposed to live within us. To have the bread alone and not eat it is to be powerless. It is to be a powerless people. So for six days the priest would see the bread. And they had knowledge of the bread by looking at it. But it was only when the bread was inside them, when they had consumed it, that they began to have understanding. That's why it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Are we beginning to understand the importance of the second covenant in the Torah of Yahweh in our lives? It's the bread of life that brings us together. It's the bread of life and the instructions of Yahweh live through a life of a person who is filled with Yahweh's spirit that brings unity in the body. Because it is Yeshua that restores the fallen tent of David. He restores the fallen tent of David as we yield to the Ruach's work in our lives. He brings unity between all people. You see, this is why the next covenant is called the Divinic, because it's the realm of sons and daughters and unity, as well as perfection in Messiah Yeshua. Perfection meaning what? Tamim, spiritual, mature people. That is why the picture of the first remnant is from each of the 12 tribes. That is why it says that there is 144,000, which is taken from what? From each of the 12 tribes, because they are a representation of the ultimate plan of unity for all Israel, for those who will trust in Messiah Yeshua and walk in His ways. Brothers and sisters, so far, both the lampstand and the table have to do with the Torah, the word of Yahweh. And we can see that Yeshua is the bread of life, who is the very words that we should feast on. He's the light of the world too. And we know that David said that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So, so far, we have come to see that this section, brothers and sisters, so far, everything in this section is all about that deeper, more intimate relationship with our Father. Now, as we move on, brothers and sisters, we are going to be moving on right up to the altar of incense. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 30, verse 1 onwards. And we read the following, and it says this. It says, And you shall make an altar to burn incense on. Make it again of acacia wood, a cubit long and a cubit wide. It is a square. And two cubits high, its horns of the same. And you shall overlay its top and its sides all around and its horns with clean gold. And you shall make for it a molding of gold all around. And make two gold rings for it. Under the molding on both its sides, make them on its two sides. And they shall be holders for the poles to lift it with. 
and you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the witness, before the lid of atonement that is over the witness. There I am to meet with you. And Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense morning by morning as he tends the lamps. He shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps between the evenings, he shall burn incense on it, a continual incense before Yahweh throughout your generations. Do not offer strange incense on it or a burnt offering or a grain offering and do not pour a drink offering on it. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he makes atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most set apart to Yahweh. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying the following. Now, brothers and sisters, firstly what we need to understand about this altar is that we learn that it is made of the same materials as the ark again. It's made of that acacia wood. And we see that it is placed right before the inner veil. And this means that as you begin, brothers and sisters, as we begin our approach to Yahweh at the gate, the last place where you would stand before entering the most holy place is at this very altar, this altar of the incense or the altar of prayer. And you see, this would mean that you would have a full understanding of what the sacrifice is all about. This is speaking again of covenants. And you know, I believe that it's possible that Aaron's two sons circumvented the copper altar of sacrifice and they attempted to burn their own incense on the golden altar and they were killed because of their irrever irreverence. Now the altar was the place where the priest would experience the last stage of transformation that took place in the holy place. And this altar was strictly for burning incense. Nothing else was allowed to fall upon this altar. It was strictly for burning incense incense. The altar had several names attributed to it. The altar of incense, it's commonly called the altar of gold or the inner altar. Because we had the outer altar where the sacrifices took place, now we have the inner altar where incense is burnt. You know, the last name is very telling. It speaks of the inner dimension you see, at the altar of copper, we come into relationship and it's only inside the holy place where we begin to have that more intimate fellowship with the Father. There cannot be fellowship without relationship and relationship is restored at the first altar. And it's interesting to know that the details of the altar of incense stand between the Mishkan details in Parashah Terimah and Kitisa, which is actually the golden calf info. And at this altar speaks of prayer and intercession. And what made the altar of incense the altar of incense was the incense itself. And you know, many focus on the fact that the incense burned is actually a symbol of our prayers. Yet there is much more in this specific picture that we need to understand. My wife, Elia, wrote an article on this very subject and it shed lights on the incense in relation to us as believers. And I have asked her and she has given me full permission to put it in this teaching as I feel that it's so, so important to understand about the incense that was burnt upon this altar in relation to a life of a believer. Now, fragrant spices of stacked onica, galabanum, or galbanum and frankincense in equal amounts were to be utilized for the blended incense. I always wonder why they have to come up with these really difficult tongue-twisting words. I am not always the best person for these tongue-twisting words. Hey, but I do my best. Praise Yahweh. Anyway, let's get back. Now let's have a look at these different spices. Now stacked is in fact liquid myrrh, which is produced by slicing the bark of the myrrh tree until white resin drops like a tear. And it drops from the tree like you can see on the picture on your screen. And the word for myrrh in Hebrew is the word mor, M-O-R. And the root word for mara, which means bitter. Now laying down our lives, brothers and sisters, has been a subject that we have been speaking about on this channel for a very, very long time. So what this actually means, the word for myrrh in Hebrew is the word more, and the root word mara, which means bitter. You see, laying down our lives, our hearts, and crucifying our flesh is a bitter process. That is why so many people don't want to do it, because it is a process that, that is bitter. Sometimes it can even be painful. You see, feeling the fire of trial and discipline, 
the fire of cleansing and conviction. Sometimes it can hurt and it can cause pain. Why? Because the flesh desires its own way of life. The flesh is in opposition to the spirit. But the stacked or liquid myrrh that burns before the throne of the king, brothers and sisters, that liquid myrrh is a sweet aroma to him. That is why you and I, we need to go through the refinement in our lives so that we become the fragrance of Messiah Yeshua to a dying world. The second spice is onica. And a debate rages as to whether onica was produced from a shellfish or whatever it was produced from a plant or, 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 or whether it comes, as I said, from a shellfish, pardon me, or whether it was produced from a plant substance. Now, as the Israelites were instructed to manufacture the incense while journeying through the desert, it's more likely that the spice was a plant substance. And the commentator Rashi stated that onica was in fact a plant root, while the Talmud states that it was an annual plant which grew in the desert of Sinai. Now, interestingly enough, onica is mentioned once in the Bible, and this is its only usage. The Hebrew word for onica is sechelet. S-H-E-C-H-E-L-E-T-H. And it is derived from the root word that means to roar like a lion, like a fierce lion. And you know, this is beautiful in light of the reality that Yeshua, our Messiah, the Bible says that he is described and defined as the lion of Judah. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 45, it says, I wept and I, and, and, and I, and, and I was, it says, I wept and wept. Because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed, praise Yahweh. And he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Why? Because he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the true groom. And we've spoken about this already in previous teachings, that it was only the groom that was able to open the ketubah that had seven signatures signified on it. And when you look into this passage of scripture, you will come to see that as he opens that scroll, there is seven. Why is he opening it? He's opening it because according to what is found within it, he shall judge the world and every single person that does not measure up shall not be his bride. He's the only one that is allowed to open that scroll. Now, in the Hebrew scriptures, Yahweh is sometimes depicted as a lion who roars in judgment against the nations and against his own faithless people. He's also a mighty lion who fights fiercely on behalf of his people. Now, to include this rare and unique spice with its unique meaning is a remarkable statement that Yahweh is trying to make to his people. You see, if our lives are submitted to, to impurity or things like idolatry and works of darkness and evil, What's going to happen? He will roar in judgment against us. And we will fall like Nadav and Abihu that we just spoke about in Leviticus chapter 10. What happened? They offered wrong incense and fire before the throne of Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, we cannot believe or think for one moment that we can bypass the ordained steps of Elohim in order to be sanctified before His throne. You cannot go from salvation and automatically become a son and daughter if you are not willing to keep Yahweh's Torah. We are to approach the brazen altar first. We are to be cleansed by washing at that laver. And we are to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, whole and complete before His throne. The brokenness in our lives and the surrendered nature of our hearts, brothers and sisters, that will become the incense that burns before the veil. The veil that separates us from His manifest presence. You see, Onika symbolizes the fact that if we are surrendered to a life of service to the King, that He promises to protect us. Psalm 91. Isn't this exactly what it says about the congregation of Philadelphia? Those who hold the key of David, they will be protected in the hour of trial? Are you beginning to see the picture here, brothers and sisters? Not everyone is protected. 
some will still have to go through the fire so that they might be purified. But those who have matured in their faith, those that have become Tamim, those that have gone from being a child into being a true disciple, they shall be protected in the hour of trial. And Yahweh says to them that there shall be a great door of opportunity that opens. Wake up and see these things are happening in this generation that you're alive in. Onychus symbolizes the fact that if we are surrendered to a life of service to the king, he promises to protect us, Psalm 91, and to fight for us, defeating our enemies in judgment, defeating the accuser, defeating our enemies in judgment. But beware, if you enter in a manner unworthy of the king, you shall face death. Now the next spice is galbanum, and it's derived from the Hebrew word chilev, which means to be fat or to offer up the richest or finest matter of a gift or an offering. Now galbanum was a gum resin that was used extensively for healing. It was and is still is utilized today as a fixer of fragrances. The reason why is because it brings out the smell of the fragrances it is mixed with. And according to Torah man, is not permitted, according to the Torah, pardon me, according to the Torah, man is not permitted to eat of the fat. Why? Because it's reserved for Yahweh alone. Let's have a look at what it says in Leviticus chapter 3, verse 14 to 16. It says the following, For what you offer, you are to present this food offering to Yahweh, the eternal organs and all the fat that is connected to them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins, and the long lobe of the liver, which you will remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering, a pleasing aroma. All the fat is Yahweh's. So what does this mean for us? You see, as we offer up our lives to the King of Kings, we need to offer up everything. Not just today what we feel like. We need to be offering up everything. The best of what we have should be poured out before Him. You know, as someone once commentated, many in the body of Messiah are spiritually overweight. And they are spiritually overweight from taking to themselves that which belongs to Yahweh alone, the fat. And they are sitting with it. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that Yahweh alone is worthy of our praise. He alone is worthy of our adoration, our worship, and our entire hearts and beings. This is the fat that He requires from us. Now, on a deeper level, the Hebrew word chilev contains within it the Hebrew word lev. And we know that the Hebrew word lev means heart. You know, perhaps we can adhere to the, 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 the admonishment of signs. Eat less, eat less saturated fat and your heart will stay healthier and happier for longer. The same thing rings true in the spiritual sense. Stop taking the glory of Yahweh for yourself, but pour it out where it belongs. Upon his altar, then your heart will likewise remain humble, contrite, and healthy before the King of Kings. You know, brothers and sisters, Yahweh has really been speaking to me and telling me that when I finish this series, that I need to do a teaching on the great apostasy and upon the scriptures found in Timothy where it says that they will be lovers of self. This is happening today, brothers and sisters, where people are taking the glory of Yahweh for themselves. They are taking the fat. And he's not happy. Pardon me. The next spice was frankincense. And you know, frankincense is a popular spice and well known by many Christians and Bible scholars. Along with myrrh, it was a spice brought to the infant Yeshua by the Magi, who had followed his star. To Bethlehem. Now, in order to present gifts to the Savior of the world, they came and they presented not only frankincense, but they came and they presented frankincense, gold, and myrrh. And frankincense in Hebrew is levonah, L E V O N A H. It's from the Hebrew word lavan or lavan, which means white. And you know, this spice was also gathered by cutting slices into the bark of the tree. And these cuts would cause white milk to drip from the box. And as this white milk was commonly referred to, it was referred to as tears. 
You see, frankincense has a bitter taste, but it is powerfully aromatic and is referred to as a pleasing odor to Yahweh in Leviticus chapter 15 to 16. Not only was it offered as a gift to the Savior, it was utilized in the grain offerings of Israel and it was offered up along with the showbread in the holy place. Frankincense teaches us, brothers and sisters, that in order to be a sweet-smelling sacrifice to Yahweh, we are to be purified and spotless. We are to be tamim and we are to be arrayed in white garments without spot and blemish. Are you beginning to see the importance of the shadow? Our hearts are to be burnt by the coals on the altar of incense, so that what is left rises to the throne, and that which rises shall be a pleasing aroma to the king. Brothers and sisters, it's not enough for the bride and Messiah to wear a white spotless wedding gown. She is to be wearing the fragrance of the king, the smell of Yeshua, the only fragrance that is acceptable to him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 to 16, it says the following, Now thanks be to Elohim who always leads us in triumph in Messiah, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to Yahweh the fragrance of Messiah among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Isn't that just an awesome scripture? Praise Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, the Holy of Holies is one of the most important sections of the tabernacle. It's the place where Yahweh works in us. And we have come to see that the outer court is where he draws us to him and where he reveals himself to us. Yet it is the duty of each person to desire to walk in holiness and pass through the curtain into the holy place so that he can begin to deal with our hearts and refine us as we seek a more intimate relationship with him. The gold speaks of refinement and this is the place of refinement where his word is washing us clean as we yield to his instructions. Yet as we have seen, this is not yet the perfect will of Elohim. And you know, I'm reminded of a passage of scripture that's found in Revelation chapter 3 verse 18. And it's where Messiah Yeshua is rebuking one of the seven assemblies. And he says to them, that I advise you to buy gold from me. Why? Because he has refined gold. Gold that has been purified by fire. That is the gold, brothers and sisters, that we are to purchase. But how do we purchase that gold? We purchase it by our lives. Laying our lives down. That is the currency that purchases the gold that has been refined by fire. He says, then you will be rich. Not rich like the world. Rich in Messiah Yeshua. And he says, why are you walking around with tattered garments? He says, I advise you to buy white garments from me so that you will not be ashamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so you'll be able to see. You see, brothers and sisters, many, many people today are not wanting the refinement. The refinement opens your eyes. The refinement of his ruach gives you spiritual discernment. So many people today are saying, no, I don't want nothing to do with the ruach. And they are walking around blind. And they're walking around with knowledge and they're saying that they're rich. But they don't have the gold that was refined by Messiah Yeshua. They only have their knowledge. If you read further on in that scripture, it tells him, him very clearly that you're wretched and pitiable. We really need to understand these things. This brings us, brothers and sisters, to the veil you know the veil is one of the most important parts of uh, how do i say parts of furnishings within the tabernacle it really is a true picture of messiah yeshua's life his death let's take a look at what it says in the book of hebrews chapter 10 and verse 20 it says by a new and living way which he instructed for us through the veil that is his flesh the veil is significant of his flesh and having a high priest over the house of Elohim, let us draw near with a true heart. In other words, with a pure conscience and a, and, a, and a pure heart. In completeness of belief, having our hearts sprinkled from a wicked conscience and our bodies washed with clean water. 
Now in part one, we came to already see that Messiah Yeshua, He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way back to Yahweh. There is no other way back to Yahweh. Only through Messiah Yeshua. Only through His finished work. You see, we must have His flesh, His body, and His blood. The veil that was His flesh was rent and torn so that we might enter. Let's take a look at what happened when Yeshua was crucified. If you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 23, verse 44 to verse 46. And it says, And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Yeshua had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, <laughs> the King James Version says, and he gave up the ghost. <laughs> he died. Now there's nine things that we need to understand about the role of a priest. The first one is that a priest is not a priest unless he has a sacrifice and an altar. The second one is that the consecrating ceremony of the priest, in other words, to make holy, to make set apart, was as follows. The Bible says that blood was applied to the priest's right ear, his thumb and his toe. Furthermore, it says that sacrifices had to be offered on an altar made of wood and overlaid with copper. The Bible says that lambs were sacrificed twice per day, one at 9 a.m. and one at 3 p.m. And this happened every day of the week. And the Bible says that Yahweh held the high priest, the high priest personally responsible for the offerings. The high priest was not allowed to sit between the times of 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. The Bible says that at completion of the sacrifice, that the priest would put up his hands in the air and shout, Nikmar. Now this is very, very important to understand. You see, on the day of Passover, all rituals, every single thing, point 1 to point 9 that I just mentioned, were the same. But an additional Passover lamb was sacrificed exactly at 12. In other words, on that specific day, the day of Passover, Pesach, three lambs were slaughtered. And we know that our high priest also had an altar and a sacrifice. We know that his body and the stake that he was on, that his body, pardon me, that his body was sacrificed on a stake. The Bible tells us, and, I, I, and history also tells us, how hectic it was to be crucified in that way. We know that there was blood in his ear, thumb and toe. Actually, his entire body was covered in blood. And history tells us that bronze nails were used to crucify Roman victims. Brothers and sisters, Yeshua had bronze nails driven through his hands into the wooden stake. The day that Yeshua was crucified was exactly the 14th of Nisan. And Mark chapter 15 verse 25 says, And it was the third hour. The third hour in those days was 9 a.m. And the Bible says at the third hour they crucified him. They drove the nails through his body at the third hour. And Mark chapter 15 verse 33 says, When the sixth hour had come, three hours later, meaning 12 p.m., the Bible says that there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, until 3 p.m. Are you beginning to see how this lines up? And you see, this was the exact time when the Passover lamb was killed. The Passover lamb was killed at 12 noon in the temple. This is what 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says. It says, get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. You see, brothers and sisters, Yeshua is our perfect Passover lamb, without spot or blemish. We also know that Yahweh held Yeshua personally responsible to fully complete the sacrifice, just as was the custom of the high priest. He couldn't sit between the hours of 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. He wasn't allowed to sit. It was only at the end that he would sit down and he would say, it is finished. We need to remember three lambs were offered at Passover. There was a third one that was offered at 3 p.m., which was the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, they killed the last one. 
And it was at that time that Yeshua paid the full price for you and I, as Mark chapter 15 verse 34 says. With Yeshua's last breath, he cried out, it is finished in the Greek. And this is the same words that the high priest would say at the end. It is finished. Yet the Hebrew word for finished is kala. Which also means bride. Isn't that just awesome? Yeshua was dying for his bride so that he might return and be cleansed by his sacrifice. So that she, pardon me, might return and be cleansed by his sacrifice. Let me read that last statement to you again. It was with Yeshua's last breath, brothers and sisters, that he cried out, it is finished in the Greek. As many people have come to understand, it is finished. And this is the same words that the high priest would say at the end. He would cry out at the end of his duty and say, it is finished, it is done. Yet the Hebrew word for finished is kala, which also means bride. You see, Yeshua was dying for his bride, for you, for me, for the entire world. So that through his death and resurrection, you and I might have access back to the Father so that we might return and become cleansed by his blood. Praise him. Seriously, praise Yahweh. You see, the high priest could not sit from nine to three. He had to take full responsibility for the sacrifices during that time. And we know that Yeshua, he took full responsibility for the ultimate sacrifice while he hung on the stake. And that is why it says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11, And indeed, every priest stands day by day doing service and repeatedly offering the same slaughter offerings which are never able to take away sins. But he, having offered one slaughter offering for sins for all time, that doesn't mean, hey, you know what, it means for all generations, that's what it means. It doesn't mean that today you can go and sin and that your sins are forgiven for all time. No, it means once for all generations, past and present generations who believe in Messiah Yeshua, they have redemption. But he, having offered one slaughter offering for sins for all time, sat down, hallelujah, at the right hand of Elohim. Now let's get back to the veil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12, it says the following, from verse 12 to verse 18. Having then such expectation, we use much boldness of speech, and not like Moshe who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel should not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when the old covenant is being read, that same veil remains, not lifted because in Messiah it is taken away. But to this day, when Messiah, pardon me, when Moshe is being read, a veil lies on their heart. Why? Because they don't have his Ruach. And when one turns to the Master, the veil is taken away. Why? Because his Ruach comes to abide within us. Now Yahweh is spirit, and where the spirit of Yahweh is, there is freedom. And we all with an unveiled face will see as in a mirror the esteem of Yahweh. And we are being transformed into the same likeness from esteem to esteem as from Yahweh the Spirit. You see, what we need to understand is that Yeshua is the glory of Yahweh. He is the exact representation of the invisible Elohim. And you and I are being changed into that very image as we yield to His Ruach. This is a new and living way. This new and living way, brothers and sisters, to be reconciled to the Father is through Messiah Yeshua's uncorrupted flesh. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 tells us, Having therefore, brethren, boldness pardon me i don't know where i thought i had that <laughs> that scripture let me read it to you therefore brethren boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of yeshua a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having a high priest over the house of elohim Brothers and sisters, there is no way that we can approach Yahweh without Yeshua's flesh and body. That is why we have to partake of it. That is what it means to be reborn. Do you see now why it is imperative to acknowledge that Yeshua has come in the flesh? That He is the Son of Yahweh and of the same substance, in other words, that He is begotten of His Father? You know, there's a scripture that is found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. It says, By this you know the Spirit of Elohim. Every spirit that confesses that Yeshua the Messiah has come in the flesh is of Elohim. And every spirit that does not confess that Messiah Yeshua has come in the flesh is not of Elohim. 
And this is the spirit of the anti-Messiah which you heard is coming and now is already in the world. You are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Praise Yahweh. Now let us continue to see what the scriptures say about this image that needs to be restored. In John chapter 14 verse 5, it says the following. In John chapter 14 verse 5, it says, Master, I really missed these slides today. I, I, <laughs> I apologize for that. But I will give the notes and they will be found on the website. So it says in John chapter 14 verse 5, Thomas said to him, Master, we do not know where you are going and how we are able to know the way. And Yeshua said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father too. From now on, you know him and have seen him. He is saying to them that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Through me, you have access back through that tabernacle, back to the Holy of Holies. You have access back to the throne of the Father. If you walk through my covenants, if you do what is required of you, if you don't stay an outer court believer, Brothers and sisters, this is so, so important. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he talked about the need to have this veil of the heart and mind circumcised. But in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 5, it says the following, He will bring you to the land that belonged to your fathers, and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. Yahweh your Elohim will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so they may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. Yahweh your Elohim will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You know, it was right here after Israel's sin of worshipping a graven image, the golden calf, that Yahweh talks about destroying Israel and starting anew with Moshe. But after Moshe's intercession, Yahweh writes his covenant again and promises to place it in their hearts. Deuteronomy 30 verse 10, it says, If you shall hearken unto the voice of Yahweh thy Elohim, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if thou shalt turn unto Yahweh thy Elohim with all thine heart and with all thy soul. In order to walk like this, brothers and sisters, it requires the circumcision of the hearts for the accomplishment of this promise. You see, brothers and sisters, his desire is for his Torah to be placed in our hearts. That is why Hebrews chapter 8 verse 7 says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold the days come, saith Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not, saith Yahweh. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them an Elohim, and they shall be to me a people. I will be to them a magistrate. That is what it means. You see, brothers and sisters, just as our hearts should be circumcised, the temple was rent, as was Yeshua's flesh. Our hearts need to return to the covenant and to all of Yahweh's Torah. You see, by doing this, we regain Yahweh's image in our lives. The image that was lost in the Garden of Eden. You know, the veil, brothers and sisters, is symbolic of the flesh of Yeshua. And that only through His sacrifice and His death and resurrection, only through that do we have reconciliation. By putting off the old man and putting on Yeshua, we regain that image and we learn to walk in covenant. This is not a, a thing that happens overnight. No, this is a lifelong process. You know, contrary to what many teach, the way back into the Holy of Holies has been made accessible. Not as the church is taught by the keeping of, of doing all these things like, like uh, going to home cell and this. No, it is, it is not taught in the way that the church taught but it is taught by the keeping of Yahweh's commandments, as Yahweh said. And by doing these things, you shall move from the outer court, from just being a saved person, unto perfection, as Rabbi Shul says. But we will never stop serving, which is significant of salvation. Yet we move through each covenant unto perfection. 
unto a Tamim person. You know, it was Yeshua's death, brothers and sisters, that opened the way and it elevated him to the status of our great high priest. And the scriptures tell us that he is the great high priest and that we are not able to partake of his better priesthood unless we choose to walk in covenant, unless we choose to obtain and to, to take hold, pardon me, not obtain, but take hold of his Torah and his instructions. In order to be a priest in the order of righteousness, it takes um, laying your life down and walking a life of maturity and sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, the way is open to return to the place of sons and daughters. It happens by the washing of the word and the keeping of his commandments and living in all the covenants of truth. The tabernacle is the shadow of Messiah. Everything in it points to him. He was the veil. He is, pardon me, he is the veil. He is the altar of incense. He is the menorah. He is the table of showbread. He is the sacrificial altar. And he is the laver. Brothers and sisters, I pray that as you study Yahweh's word, that the study of his word will lead you to a deeper, more intimate relationship with him. You know, the veil in the temple was a constant reminder that sin renders humanity unfit for the presence of Yahweh. And you know, the same still applies today. Yet he has given us the process of walking in covenant and learning to deal with our hearts so that we might get to the place of true intimacy and power in him. And you know, this reminds me of the sons of Zadok because this is the place of the sons of Zadok, those that have chosen to stay connected to David. Remember the sons of Zadok, they remained faithful to David in a time of great trial. And this is speaking about those that will remain faithful to Messiah Yeshua, who is the branch in a time of great distress, which is about to take place. Those that truly walk in the perfect will of Elohim, they shall inherit Him. They are not worried about the praises of men. They are not worried about how people elevate them or praise them or praise their ministries or do whatever. Because they know that no matter the cost, in the end they shall inherit the intimacy of Messiah Yeshua. Go and read Ezekiel chapter 44. Those that truly walk in the perfect will of Elohim shall inherit Him and they shall stand in the presence of the King with great boldness. Ezekiel chapter 44, 15 onward says, But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who guarded the duty of my set-apart place, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall draw near to me to serve me and shall stand before me to bring me the fat and the blood, declares the Master, Yahweh. And they shall enter my set-apart place, and they shall draw near to my table to serve me, and they shall guard my charge. Brothers and sisters, I pray that you are coming to see the true importance of the shadow in relation to your walk in Messiah. You know, over and over again I have said that many are speaking about being priests, yet they have no idea what that really means. You and I are to move from the outer court past the copper altar, not laying again a foundation of repentance and laying on of hands, but we are to strive to press on to perfection, to become tamim, telios, so that we can put on the true image of Yeshua. Brothers and sisters, the holy place is all about a deeper relationship with Abba, a laying down of our lives to embrace the life that he wants to live through us. We have already forsaken all other ways for the, <laughs> for the way, the truth, and the life. We lay down all other ways so that we may enter through that gate which leads to eternal life. Yet now, you and I are faced with a decision. We are faced with a decision that we need to make in this life. As we continue to walk with Him, we need to learn to lay our lives down. And we need to learn to get rid of all forms of half-truth. And we need to learn to walk in the covenants of our King. You know, the light of the truth needs to shine in us like the menorah. As we put Abba's word in our heart, we will come to understand the importance of unity and fellowship, as well as daily surrender. And this will ultimately lead, it will ultimately lead us 
to becoming the fragrance of Messiah Yeshua in this earth. This is what the pleasing will of Messiah is all about. As I've said over and over, first he reveals himself to us, which is significant of salvation. Then he begins to reveal himself in us, which speaks about the Mosaic Covenant, the Torah, which is also speaking about the Holy Place. By the washing of the word and the purification of his Ruach, which is representative of fire. It is then that we grow up and we mature and we begin to radiate him and we begin to smell like him. It's only then that we are ready to move to the next place, the true perfect will of Elohim, where it is no longer about us but all about him, where we become the true sons and daughters of righteousness. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to leave you with a scripture that many seem to struggle with. And I believe the reason for this is because we have shunned the Yahweh ordained way of doing things. And I have said it before and I will say it again. We will never truly become the people of Yah if we don't take heed of the plan that has been left for us. Yeshua's death opened the way for every person who chooses the narrow path to be included in his priesthood. But Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that Yeshua went down into the grave, yet he rose again and in so doing he gave gifts unto men. These gifts are for the perfecting of the saints. That word perfecting is the Greek word teleos. Till everybody comes to a mature adult. That's what it means. It means to be mature in moral character. And this is the same concept found in the word tamim. Yet today we still continue to only have one office working in the messianic faith. Teachers. We have so many teachers. We are the apostles. We are the prophets. We are the evangelists. If we want to be a spiritually mature people that is able to enter into that realm of great, great anointing and power where we are carrying the very presence of our Father in our lives, then we need to get busy getting the right structure initiated and stop trying to seek ourselves teachers that tickle our ears and find the people that will speak the word of truth that refines us and they will tell us the things that we not that we don't always want to hear Ephesians chapter 4 verse 10 says and who went down is also the one who went up far above all the heavens to fill and he himself gave some as missionaries and some as prophets brothers and sisters before I even continue these are not new things that Rabbi Sheol is writing about they were sent ones which means the missionaries right in the very beginning they were prophets right in the beginning they have been evangelists from the very beginning and they have been teachers and judges over Yahweh's people and he says that he has given these people these these offices these these gifts to the body let's not even think about it as offices it's, it's a gift for the perfecting for bringing the people to a spiritual mature level, to the work of service, to the building up of the body of Messiah, until we all come to the unity of the belief. We are not all at the same unity of the belief, and we are all not yet at the knowledge of the Son of Elohim, to a perfect man, to a, a perfect man, Telios, to a man who is spiritually mature, to the measure of the stature of the completeness of Messiah, so that we should no longer be children, why? Because he wants you to be a son. A child is tossed and born about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men in cleverness, and to the craftiness of leading astray. But maintaining the truth in love, we grow up in all respects into him who is the head, Messiah. What are you seeking? Are you seeking people to tickle your ears? Or are you seeking the fire of of refinement that will change you and set you apart and put you on a journey a journey of change brothers and sisters I, I really pray today I pray that as you have heard everything that has been presented to you I pray in the name of Yeshua that the word of Yahweh has spoken to your heart, that it has penetrated into your heart and that you are never going to be the same again. That you will come to an understanding that the Father is looking for you to lay your life down, to, to give Him your all, to fast, to pray, to seek Him, to allow Him to work through you as His hands and feet upon this earth. He loves you. He cares for you. He died for you. Let's pray. 
Father, in the name of Yeshua, we want to come to you this evening, Father, and I want to pray, Father, that you will bless and, and, and keep each and every person. Father Yahweh, I pray in Yeshua's name that every single person that listened to this teaching today, Father, that they will not leave the same when they put this teaching off. Father, that they will go and pray and seek your face. Father, that every single thing that has been presented in your word, Father, will not just go in the one ear and out the other, but that it will filter down into their hearts. Father, that there will be people that move from the outer court into the realm, Father, of sons and daughters where they will be ready, Father, to be called upon by you in this generation to count the cost, to stand up as a light to the nations, to stand up as a person proclaiming the word of truth, whether it be to their families, their friends, or whether it be on a stage to a thousand, to two thousand, to millions. May they have faith. May they be secure. May they walk in your ways, Father. May they be like Noah and Abraham. May they not just be people, Father, that walk in the righteousness of Elohim, but may they be tamim in all that they do and say and share with others. Father, raise up a generation of warriors in this time that we are alive in. People who will stand and not be moved by every wind of doctrine. Father Yahweh, we praise you, we honor you, and we thank you, Father, for your word. Your word is alive and it shall not return until it accomplishes what it set out to do. It shall not return void. Father Yahweh, we thank you and we praise you today. I pray blessing over each and every person that has joined. And Father, I pray, Yahweh, that this word will really seep into them, and that you will bless them in Yeshua's name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to please consider heading over to our website at www.treasuredinheritanceministry.com. We do our best to upload all these notes, even though at times they are unedited. But we put the notes up for you to download. Pardon me, so that when you follow and listen to the teaching, that you have the notes so that you can make your own notes too, and that you can study um, the word of Yahweh for yourself. I also would like to invite you to subscribe to this channel. By subscribing, you really help us to get out to more people. And by subscribing and liking and thumbs upping the videos, it really helps us for um, to get the word of Yahweh to all nations and all tribes. So please take the videos, share it on your Facebook, share it on your channel, and feel free to share them wherever you feel. Again, I thank you for joining me, and I pray that you'll come back for part five as we begin, begin to look at the Ark of the Testament as well as the sacrifices and apply the principles to our lives as we grow up. Messiah Yeshua. Again, thank you for joining me, and I'll see you soon. Shalom.